Okay, everybody, welcome back to 162. Um, today we're going to dive into some actual implementation details and start talking about uh, how threads are implemented in the kernel and um, some things you need to worry about synchronization. So, uh, welcome back. Um, if you remember from last time, uh, we were talking about high level. APIs. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about synchronization. In particular, we're going to start by understanding how the operating system gives you concurrency through threads uh, and a brief discussion of process thread states and scheduling, some high level discussion of how stacks contribute to concurrency. Um, on Monday, we'll talk more about uh, what Pintos does to give you threads and even dive deeper. But today, we're going to start diving into the kernel. And then we're going to talk about why we need synchronization. And then we're going to explore locks and semaphores in a little more detail. So if you recall, though, from last time, we talked about uh, inter-process communication, or IPC. And that was a mechanism to create communication channel between distinct processes. And the reason we wanted to do that was, well, we started with all of this work to make sure processes were isolated from each other. But then we need to figure out how to selectively punch holes uh, into that protection so that those processes uh, can communicate when they want to. And um, we uh, are going to need to start thinking about protocols. So maybe there's a serialization format, especially if you go across the network. Um, one good thing about having processes ra uh, rather than um, combining everything into one process is you can have failure isolation. That can get interesting. Um, we'll talk more about that later in the term. And uh, there's many uses in interaction patterns here. Uh, once you have processes possibly spreading across the network, uh, and then you combine them together, you can do all sorts of interesting things. And uh, toward the end of the term, we're going to even talk about peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer style communications and, uh, and cloud communications as well. So the other thing uh, we were talking about is we talked about types of IPC. So for instance, we talked about Unix pipes. And the idea here is very simple. A Unix pipe is a data structure queue inside the kernel. Um, one process can write to uh, the, the input end of the pipe, and the other process can read from it. And notice that we're using the read and write uh, system calls, the low-level raw interfaces, just like we would if that were a file, except that this is a in-memory queue of limited size. And so as a result, um, it's more efficient if we're not trying to make things persistent. So the memory buffer is finite, which basically means that if the producer tries to write it uh, and the buffer is full, then it blocks, which means it goes to sleep. And if the consumer tries to read when the buffer is empty, it blocks, uh, which means it goes to sleep. Today, we're going to start understanding what it means to get put to sleep and how that actually works. Okay? Uh, we also talked briefly about this uh, particular system called pipe that takes uh, a two-entry array of file descriptors, and it fills them with uh, the read and write end of the pipe. And we also talked about then how to go through with uh, fork to set up communication between two processes. So you should take a look at uh, the last part of the lecture um, last time. Uh, the other thing is we talked about sockets. And um, key idea here was that, um, well, pipes are communication on the uh, same machine, but we could have communication across the world that looks also like file I.O. And so we had this notion of a socket, which is a bi-directional communication channel. Now, pipes, of course, were single uh, direction, um, kind of like half duplex, if you will. A socket ha is an endpoint for communication and bi-directional communication. And so uh, you have a socket on either side. There's a process for connecting, which we talked about. And um, notice that queues, uh, the green things here that are inside the sockets, are not pipes. There was some discussion of that on Piazza. Um, queues are uh, places to hold and temporarily hold information. Uh, so when you take two sockets and you connect them together, now you actually have a communication channel, two directions that are independent of each other from process to process. And that could be on the same machine. It could be in the local area network. It could be uh, spanning the globe. Um, and so as part of that discussion, we did a brief talk about how sockets get set up for TCP IP. And if you see the two green sockets here are the final communication. Uh, but we, we talked about how you set up a server socket that uh, is bound on a certain port. Uh, the first socket of the client side requests a connection. The server socket then produces a new socket just for that connection. And now this yellow, 
channel between the two sockets is a unique channel, and it's defined uniquely by these five numbers that you see at the left, uh, the source IP address, the destination IP address, the source port number, destination port number, and protocol, where uh, we're talking TCP IP in this particular instance. And the, the client side of this socket often has a random port, and that's why, in fact, you can have multiple tabs on a browser that all connect to the same website and act independently. Uh, on the server side, you have well-known ports like 80 for the web or 443 for a secure web, 25 for send mail, et cetera. And the well-known ports are all from zero to 1,024. Okay. And then last but not least, we went through several different versions of uh, a web server-like protocol. This was uh, the very first one we looked at. And uh, we talked about how you, you generate the socket that's the first little red thing in this code. That generation has a, has a family of uh, addresses and so on, protocols that it's in. Then you bind the address to that socket, okay? And that's where uh, what comes into play is what port is it interested in uh, serving and what's the local address. And then you listen. And that listen is exactly what you see here when you see the ear, right? That's uh, listening for incoming connections. And then in a loop, you accept the next connection, and what comes out of accept is a brand new uh, file descriptor, which is the uh, file descriptor opposite uh, side for the server. And so that's um, this green socket comes in from accept, and then you can do anything you want with it. And uh, just as you might remember, this particular instance that we gave was uh, an instance that was uh, had no parallelism. And so this basically takes connections one at a time, you want to see our discussion on uh, several variants of that uh, afterwards, take a look at uh, the lecture from last time. All right, that was where I uh, wanted to do as a quick summary. Did we have any questions on that before I move on to some new material? Is everybody good? Yeah, I see that our, I see our numbers are a little lower today. Hopefully, hopefully others are just a little delayed. You guys are all the, the uh, most gung-ho of the students here. Okay. Yeah, homework one is due. That might have something to do with it. Okay. So um, today, let's talk now about implementation, okay? So multiplexing processes, uh, we have a process control block, which we've been discussing kind of uh, indirectly throughout the first couple of lectures. And it's really basically a chunk of memory in the kernel that describes the process. And so it has things like what's its state, what's its process ID, uh, what are its current registers and so on, if it only has one thread in it. Um, a list of open files. We've been talking a lot about file descriptors and so on. Um, okay, and so these are, these are all of the descriptors inside the kernel describing a process. The scheduler, is uh, going to main maintain a data structure uh, containing all of these process control blocks, and it's going to decide for each process and each thread within each process who gets the CPU. And we're going to have a whole lecture and plus on different schedulers. So the question of uh, who gets the next uh, little slice of CPU is a, is an extremely interesting policy decision, but that's for another day. Okay, um, and the Scheduler is going to be um, also giving out potentially non-CPU uh, resources like memory, I.O., etc. So the program counter, of course, is pointing at where in the code that particular thread uh, is currently running. Okay, so what does it mean to switch from one process to another? So uh, what it really means is here process zero is running. And by the way, now we're talking about a single threaded process. So there's one thread. So um, that process's main thread is running. Um, and at some point, an interrupt happens. Okay, and that saves all of the state, such as the registers and the program counter and the stack pointer and all that sort of stuff into the process control block for zero. And then it loads everything from process control block for one, and then it uh, returns to user level. So what's in the middle here is kernel level, what's on the outside is user level, and what's in blue is actual code execution, okay? And um, so what's in the middle here is all running at kernel level and at uh, high, um, high privilege, okay? So this is privilege level zero for system, 
privilege level three per user. And uh, as you may be well aware, that for x86, there's actually four privilege levels, but you typically only use zero and three. The other thing I wanted to show you that's interesting here, perhaps, is if we do this switching too rapidly, then um, what we're going to get is all of uh, all overhead and no execution. And so this part of the blue where it's actually executing user instructions will become a vanishing fraction of the total execution. And uh, that's a form of thrashing if you go back and forth too fast and you end up with making no actual forward progress. Okay, so the question about what the other two levels are, they are uh, diff they're called rings and um, they're in certain military specs, you have different uh, things that are somewhere between uh, system level and user level. You can use those other two. Um, sometimes it's um, sometimes it's utilized for the hypervisor in some early versions of things where level zero is actually the hypervisor and one is the kernel level and so on. So for now, however, just imagine there's two because we've only been talking about kernel and user. Now the question here about more time used uh, to waiting than executing. Uh, this is clearly not to scale. So this would be a very bad design if we ended up with a vanishingly small fraction of the time was actually executing real stuff. So what we want is we want to get to a, something under 10% or better of the time overhead so that we're you know, using most of our cycles for something useful. Uh, even though we all know that the operating system is the most interesting part of this, uh, it probably would be good to actually execute some of your real programs. So the other thing I will point out is there are a bunch of transitions. So if you notice, we go from executing process zero, we transition into the kernel, that's that little yellow dot. We exit uh, from kernel back to process and so on. And so these transitions, which are transitions in privilege level, represent uh, potentially expensive saving and restoring of registers, okay? And in this case, this uh, entry into the kernel is coming from an interrupter could be a yield system call. We'll talk about both of those as we go on. Now, a process goes through a bunch of stages, as does a thread, okay? And so um, for now, I'm not even gonna say which, which this represents, because it represents all of them. And uh, processes and threads uh, both have their thread component. But um, as far as a process, let's just talk processes for a moment. Um, the process starts from a new, uh, state, and that's going to be right after we execute fork and uh, set the process up, and then we put it on some scheduling uh, queue, which is the point at which we admit it to, say, the ready queue, okay? And so that point, it's now ready. So what that means is not that this process, the thread of this process is actually running, but rather that it's ready to run, okay? And as if you think about it, if you only have one CPU or one core, then um, there can only be one thing actually running at a time. Everything else is ready, okay? And then at some point, we, uh, the scheduler pulls it off the ready queue and it now becomes running, okay? And now if there's only one core, there can only be one thing running at a time. Later, an interrupt might happen, which brings that original thread back onto the ready queue. Some other thread will have been brought into the running state as a result, but we're only tracking sort of one processor thread at this time. Okay, and then this will go on for a while. La -da -dee. Isn't this animation great? We're going back and forth. Um, at some point, the thread or process will try to do some I.O. or do something that's going to require a wait. Like, for instance, a disk access. How many instructions does it take to do a typical disk access? What was that order of magnitude everybody's supposed to remember? Okay, a million. Yep. All right. And so a million, at least, cycles means that when we're in the waiting state here, we're, we're on a queue waiting to get serviced with our I.O., there better be something else running. So part of what we're doing is we're attempting to um, talk about how we can make uh, something that's executing put to sleep long enough that we can run other things in place and overlap I.O., and execute, uh, overlap the I.O. and the execution computation. The question here about SSDs, so SSDs are smaller. Okay, it's not a million, but it's probably 10,000 or, or 100,000. It's still gonna be big enough that um, you're gonna wanna be put on a wait queue. If we have more than one core, that's a good question, 
uh, there can be more than one thing running. And so the scheduler now has multiple run queues as well as multiple ready queues to worry about. Okay. You'll never have a single thread run on more than one processor at a time because uh, a thread only has one stack. And so if you were trying to run it on multiple uh, processors at a time, you'd get chaos. So ultimately the IO completes, we get back to the ready state and we continue our running, okay? And then finally, we will execute exit, if you remember, and that will put us in a terminated state, okay? Which is a point at which the process is no longer available to run under any circumstances, it's terminated. Okay, and can anybody think why we might not just uh, put free the process up? Why might we keep it in a terminated state laying around? Can anybody guess? Yeah, great. Because the parent needs to get the result. Okay, and so um, this is actually when it's in this state where it's terminated but not uh, uh, reallocated yet, that's typically called a zombie state. So that's a, a zombie process okay all right now uh, if you if you look uh, inside the kernel queues we have the ready queue and the CPU is the run queue but there are many other queues and so typically what happens is the process control blocks work their way from the ready queue to the CPU okay and potentially back again so if the time slice expires, meaning that the amount of time it's supposed to run expires, it gets put back on the ready queue. If it does an I.O. request, it's put on an I.O. queue until the I.O. is done, et cetera. Okay, and so scheduling is uh, the, uh, the act of deciding sort of which thing off the ready queue gets the CPU next. Okay, there's also a type of scheduling in something like a disk uh, driver, device driver, whatever, which we'll talk about uh, later in the term, which will decide kind of which request gets to go next. And that's usually there to try to optimize things like um, the, uh, the disk head not moving as much and so on. So there's lots of different types of scheduling. For now, the type of scheduling we're talking about is really when you have a bunch of things on the uh, ready queue, which one gets the CPU next. So the ready queue and all the IO device queues really, um, are things that represent non-running processes, okay? So, um, and there's a good question here. So when you, uh, when you have a fork operation, what happens? Well, you only have one uh, CPU, therefore the child process needs to be put on a queue somewhere, which gets it back in the ready queue, okay? Because you can only have one thing running at a time. This diagram's a little bit confusing, but really what you want to think about is when you go through fork, um, Potentially the child gets the CPU and the parent goes on the ready queue or vice versa, depending on the policy. Okay, and, you're, and you should never assume one or the other gets to run first because they're, uh, they're completely independent once fork executes. Um, and I, I understand that diagram is a little bit confusing on that front, but just, you know, you can only have one thing running and so there's really gonna be one of them on, is on the CPU and the other is on the ready queue. So, um, you can imagine a bunch of these queues, and they really all represent temporarily suspended threads, okay? And um, these temporarily suspended threads hold their queues of, um, of PCBs, okay? And those queues, you know, are linked lists of things, and I'm, uh, just because I'm an electrical engineer, I'm using a little ground symbol here for null, but uh, you guys can give me a little bit of, uh, of slack there. Um, but you know we have lots of different queues in the system, and they all have different uh, suspended processes in them. And um, the scheduler is potentially only uh, interacting with the ready queue. The rest of the queues are actually being interacted with through the device driver, and we'll we'll get into that um, not too long uh, in a couple of lectures. But the device driver for the disk, for instance, when a when a request comes back, potentially will remove a, a process control block from uh, its wait queue and put it back on the ready queue, and so now it's runnable again. Okay. Um, and that scheduler is, is this simple loop that is just uh, many options here, okay? We have at least a lecture and a half on scheduling because surprisingly enough, that simple question of on the ready queue, who gets to go next, vastly impacts whether the thing is responsive, if you got a person typing, or it's efficient if you've got a long-running task, 
uh, or if it's fair, if you've got multiple things running at the same time, or it, uh, if it's a real-time scheduler because you've got a car and it's uh, between pushing the brake and the brake engaging, you know, maybe there's a question of whether it's timely, okay? These are all scheduling policy questions, which are gonna be quite interesting for us, but that's for another day. The, the loop I wanted to show you here, which I've shown you before, is it's this mechanism where if there are any ready processes, okay, then it'll pick one, and it'll pick one according to a policy. So again, if there's a queue for each device has a queue of processes that are waiting on it, and so what happens when a request comes back from a disk, then it finds that process that's been waiting there, and it reactivates it. Um, and actually, in something like Linux, where the threads are, are um, kernel threads, and you'll see a little bit of that distinction in a, in a bit, then in fact, the queues are actually holding thread control blocks, not necessarily processes. So they, the granularity of threads being able to be put to sleep on these queues is really what happens in, in uh, systems where there's a one-to-one -one mapping between user thread and the kernel uh, stack or thread, okay? All right, many different scheduling policies. Um, so let's dive in a little further. So when we were talking about processes originally, we mentioned the fact that there can be many threads inside a process, okay? And each of these threads has a stack and some registers. So for now, we're gonna talk about um, threads and how they're implemented. And when it matters whether, I'm whether I need to talk about process or not, I will bring it back. But just to remind you guys, what's a process? The process is a protected environment, such as the memory uh, space, and file descriptors and all that stuff we've been talking about, plus one or more threads, okay? And the, each of those threads has uh, a thread control block with registers and a stack in it, okay? And so when we need to talk about, well, we're switching the protection environment from process one to process two, I'll make sure you know that I'm talking about that. But for now, we're gonna dive into just the concurrency portion or the threads, okay? So threads encapsulate concurrency or the active component, the address spaces, et cetera, are the passive part, and that's inside the, uh, the shell of the process. Uh, why have multiple threads per address space for sharing? Okay. Now, if you remember, this is the, uh, the shared state. Now we're within a process. All of the threads in the single process, they share the heap, they share global variables, they share code. Um, as we'll mention, some of the important global variables those threads probably are going to share are locks, et cetera. We'll get to that uh, as uh, the second half of the lecture. Um, and then each thread uh, has a thread control block that has information about where its stack is, what its registers are, metadata of various sorts, and a stack in memory. Okay, so that's per thread. And so every one of the threads has that information. Okay, and if you have too many threads, um, then you can uh, run out of space in your process. Well, the reason we haven't talked about, and there was a question here, what about virtual address translation? So the, uh, I wanted you to get a general idea about that. That's gonna require us to talk a few lectures to really get into it. And so that's why I'm, not tr I'm trying not to muddy the waters too much. So we're, we're, working on, uh, we're working on the concurrency part today. Don't worry, we'll get there. You guys are gonna be uh, really deep operating system designers by the end of this class. So the core of concurrency, as we've kind of mentioned, is this, this scheduler loop, or I'm gonna call it the dispatch loop here. And conceptually, uh, the operating, itself, operating system itself is this, an infinite loop where we run a thread, we choose the next thread, we, we save uh, the current thread state, uh, we uh, load the new thread state, and we just keep looping forever, okay? This is an infinite loop, and uh, I suppose, under a certain point of view, this is all the operating system does. It just keeps looping, uh, letting ru threads run until uh, they're either they yield the processor or they're interrupted. And then uh, we pick another one and we go, okay? So um, pretty simplistic. Uh, and now we're done. We'll have our final uh, next week and we'll be good, right? So there's the, the whole operating system. Um, but perhaps we'll do a few more details just because we can. One question might be, should we ever exit this loop? Uh, what are some good reasons to exit this loop? Anybody? <laughs> 
Okay, well, interrupts don't necessarily, well, interrupts might be kind of like a bubble, but they don't interrupt the loop because the interrupt happens and then it comes back. Yeah, shutting down the machine, PG&E, yes. Power outages, hopefully we're not gonna get too many of those uh, this season, but I'm thinking we might uh, have power shutdowns. But yes, so basically when the machine exits or it panics or any other sort of crashes, uh, you exit the loop. But by and large, we just keep it going, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna briefly talk administrivia and then we're gonna um, look more at how this all works. Okay, homework one's due today, as uh, many of you are aware. I appreciate very much that you guys are here for class. Thank you. Um, it's great to actually have people to ask questions. Um, project one is in full swing. And um, I saw an interesting query on Piazza uh, that was kind of like, well, how can I do my design document if it wants code, but I don't know how to do the project yet, okay? It seems almost like uh, that's some catch 22, that catch 22. Um, and the answer is that what we're looking for in your design document is a notion that you have read through enough of the code that you have an idea of roughly what you're gonna to need to do. You're not gonna have it all done because that's what the code deadlines are for. But um, try to give us some intuitions. It could be pseudocode. You could pick out a couple of function calls you know that are gonna be important. You could pop up, a, you could say, well, here's a, a data structure. We're gonna add these fields to it, whatever. Those are, those are not the same as we wrote a bunch of code and it works, okay? And so what we're looking for in your design document is a high level idea of what you're planning to do and why and supplemented with some code, uh, pseudocode if you like, that tells us uh, some details of where you're going and helps your TA understand what you're thinking, okay? So that's the paradox. You don't need fully working code to write a design document. That would, that would uh, be pretty strange, right? Um, the, uh, the if def user prog basically says whether there are uh, user programs uh, are supported or not. You can, you can have a kernel only version. So um, we should, you should be attending your uh, permanent discussion session. Um, remember to turn your camera on and zoom uh, and discussion sessions are mandatory. So we're taking attendance. Uh, the question is, will the design document be graded? And the answer is yes. Um, and uh, you're, trying to give us a, a understanding of your thinking in the design document and we will be grading uh, the ideas that are there and then with your TA in your design review session, uh, you'll be talking to them and um, they may be giving you a few suggestions of other things to think. So there is some, you know, the design will evolve possibly over the course of the project, that's certainly accepted, okay. Um, uh, the problem with uh, example design docs, of course, is that they sort of have answers in them. I'll, I'll see if I can find one for you, but just think about um, you're, you're trying to give a high level viewpoint to your uh, manager who's your TA, right? And you're trying to give them a, an idea that you've thought through enough about what you need to do that you're on a good path. All right. The other thing is, of course, midterm one is coming up uh, a week from tomorrow, or two weeks from tomorrow, not a week from tomorrow. <laughs> um, and uh, it's gonna be video proctored. I understand there was a little concern about how 61C's video proctoring went. Um, believe me, we're uh, well aware of everything that's been going on in the department. So uh, we will try to avoid the mistakes of the past, at least learn from them. Uh, let's see, I think that's all the administrivia. I'm not entirely sure what happened. I think that they were requiring people to record things locally and there were some issues with that under some circumstances. That's not our current plan. So uh, we'll get that out to you. Um, all right, good. Any questions on administrivia? All right, so Let's talk about running a thread. So what do we get when we run thread? How do you run a thread? Well, you load its state into the actual CPU, registers, program counter, stack pointer, okay? Um, if you're changing process, you need to load its environment. So that means get the page table set up. That's that mysterious virtual memory we haven't talked a lot about yet. Uh, get the 
you know, get anything else loaded up, and then you just jump to the BC and start running. So one thing that's going to be interesting here I, uh, for you guys is that both the, the uh, OS, which is managing threads, and the thread themselves all run on the same CPU. So when the OS is running, the thread isn't. And when the thread's running, the OS isn't. And we need to make sure that we can transition properly between those. So this idea that the OS loads up a bunch of stuff and then jumps to the PC means essentially that the OS gives up control of the CPU. All right. And, um, you know, we're going to have to deal with that, right? If, if uh, you give up control to a user program that then proceeds to go into an infinite loop, clearly we're going to need to get that back somehow. Okay. And so that's a question. How do you get it back? Now, um, I've been playing with computers long enough that I got to play with some of the early versions of Microsoft Windows, like 3.1, um, some of the early Macintoshes, and, and other PC uh, environments. And in those PC environments, what happened was the, the uh, multiple things that were running were fully cooperative. So let's suppose that you had three applications running on your screen, and they had three windows and one of the applications crashed, excuse me, what would happen is the system would freeze, okay? Nothing would move. You would have no control of the windows and the other applications either. And the reason for that is that one application which crashed and maybe went into an infinite loop kept control of the processor, okay? So fortunately, modern operating systems are not like that because we have memory protection, which is uh, an important thing, but we also have things like preemption possibilities through interrupts, which is going to be an important thing to talk about here. But even back in the day, you could have the illusion that multiple things were working. You could have many windows all drawn stuff simultaneously representing different applications. And the, the way that worked is each of those threads would run for a while, and then it would voluntarily give up the CPU by calling a yield function back into the kernel. Okay, And assuming that all of the applications cooperate, cooperated, this worked fine. It was when they didn't cooperate or forget not cooperating when they had a bug. Uh, that was a problem. Okay, so the Mac also was this way. Okay, this is back in the dark ages in the, in the early times. Okay, in the original Macintoshes. So let's talk about um, internal events first. Okay, internal events are times when where uh, Everybody's cooperating and they're voluntarily giving up the CPU. So a good example of this is blocking on I.O. When you make a system call and you ask the operating system to do a read, you're giving up the CPU uh, and therefore, you know, you're implicitly yielding it. And there's, well, the uh, operating system's working on your task by, say, talking to a disk for a million uh, instructions. It can schedule somebody else. So surprisingly, blocking on I.O. is... Uh, a great example of yielding, okay? Um, saying that you wanna wait for a different thread or a different process, uh, say with a signal operation, that's another example of voluntarily giving up the CPU because you're saying, well, I have to wait, so um, go ahead, you run that other thing for a while because it doesn't do me any good to be in a, in a loop waiting, okay? The third thing, which is uh, sort of a, um, a an example to follow for all of these things is what I'll call a yield operation, and it's actually a system call type uh, thing, which is basically, let's suppose that I wanted to run a, an application that computed pi to the last digit, okay? Well, what I would do is I'd have a, a while loop, okay, that's never going to exit because this uh, pi is uh, very long, right? And I'd compute the next digit, and then I'd yield, and then I'd go over and over and over again, okay? And I also see in the chat uh, mining Bitcoin potentially. Okay, so these are very long running things where what I've done is I've decided to execute a yield system call regularly enough that uh, multiplexing works and, and the, the system acts properly like it's got multiple threads running at the same time. Okay, now of course this particular uh, application I'm showing on the screen is flawed for, uh, for a pretty um, uh, important reason here. Does anybody know why this is, is not a great example of, of yielding regularly? Well, it yields too often, maybe initially, 
Does anybody know anything about computing pi? So the point here is that each digit you compute takes longer and longer and longer and longer. So while this particular thing seems to be yielding properly at the beginning, the yield operations are going to come at a longer and longer interval. And eventually, uh, it'll be effectively like this thing is just acting forever. Okay? So this particular use of yield uh, is probably not a great example. But assuming we yield regularly, then we uh, properly uh, multiplex things, and we are actually getting multiprocessing. Okay? So there is actually, if you remember, I gave you the POSIX API for threads in an earlier lecture, pthread create, pthread exit, pthread join. There's actually a pthread yield, although if you do a man on it, you'll see that that's considered a, not supported on all operating systems. But there's also a sketch yield, which is a similar thing. And what this does is this actually says, I yield the CPU so that another thread can run. OK, so this is a real interface. All right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, we're going to take a look at what is yield by us here. Okay? And, and uh, once we've got yield figured out, then uh, we'll graduate to a few other interesting ways to get the, the threads to give it up the processor. Okay? So let's look at this compute pi uh, function that I showed you earlier. So we compute a digit, we, we enter compute pi, and it, and it computes a digit, comes back, and it executes yield. All right, now this is the stack. So remember how stacks kind of grow down and come back up? All right, yep, sleep would be a type of yield as well. So if you, um, the compute pi uh, stack frame starts at the top. We execute yield. Now, if you, let me just show you back here. If you take a look, notice what's happening in this while true. We enter the compute pi function. So that's the first stack frame. And then we run compute next digit and come back, and then we run yield. So yield is going to have a stack frame that's just below pi, the compute pi, the way we've set this up. Okay, So that's what we're showing here. And in this uh, instance here, blues is going to be um, the user code. Okay, So we have compute pi stack frame. We have yield. Yield is going to execute a system call, all right, which means that we transition into the, ker the kernel with a system call. And at that point, we actually change stacks. So while we have uh, the user stack in the blue area, we end up in a kernel stack in the red area. And there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between a user level stack and a kernel level stack. Okay, And so we execute yield, which is then going to execute run new thread, which is going to execute a switch operation. Okay, And so we're going to go through several levels here where yield calls the run new thread operation saying, I got to pick a new thread, which is going to call switch. And we're going to find out what switch is about. But let's start for a moment with understanding why do I have blue and red here? Okay, This is not a political statement. <laughs> why is there a difference between the user level stack and the kernel stack? OK, so one to one. Uh, one to one uh, means that for every user level thread and stack, there is a kernel level stack. And I'll show you this next time when we really dive into uh, real code. OK, but for now, there's a one to one uh, kernel stack specially allocated for this thread. Can anybody tell me why, when I change modes by going into the kernel, I use the kernel uh, thread? Excuse me, I use the kernel stack rather than the user's stack? Safeguard, great. Because we don't trust the user ever. If we're a kernel, the most important thing that you need to do when you're the kernel is when you, when, uh, you get a system call comes in from the user, you check what the user gave you to make sure it's OK. And then the second most important thing is you check what the user gave you to make sure it's OK. And can you imagine what the third thing is? You check what the user gave you and make sure it's OK. And then you actually execute things. So, this is an important state here because if the user code were to um, you know, put a null or something in its stack pointer and then execute a system call, the kernel is going to panic or do something because it's not going to have a valid thread. So part of this transition from, uh, from user mode to kernel mode has to change the stack. OK. So here's what's going to happen now. This is the running the new thread. 
So we hit kernel yield calls run new thread. And notice what run new thread is. It picks the next thread to run. Okay, that's a scheduling type operation. And then it executes switch. Okay, and that switch operation is going to somehow switch to a different thread. Okay, and then we're going to do some housekeeping, which might be cleaning things up, seeing how much CPU time we're using, et cetera. So how does the dispatcher switch to a new thread? Well, we've kind of gotten an, an idea about that a little bit earlier, which is we're going to save anything that the next thread may trash, right? We've got to save the program counter and the registers and the stack pointer of this blue thing because we need to restore it later so we can co keep computing pi, which is very important, right? Pi is the important number here in this class. So, um, and then we want to make sure we maintain isolation, okay, between threads. Now, before you say, well, wait a minute, I thought threads were sharing in processes. Right now, remember our threads and our processes were intentionally uh, not distinguishing them. So we want to make sure that when you switch to another thread, we have to make sure that we don't trash this current threads stack. And if it turns out that we're um, going to a different process, we have to make sure that we change the memory protection as well, okay? So how does that switch look? Okay, well, let's look at the stacks for a moment. Let's, uh, let's assume that what switch is gonna do, I'll show you some actual uh, assembly-like code in a moment, but what switch is gonna do is it's gonna save out everything from thread A and load everything from thread uh, B back in, okay? So how to, think about this, I'm going to show you a really silly piece of code here, but this is going to help us, okay? So this code starts with uh, function A, which is going to call B, and then once we get in B, it's just going to go into an infinite loop that does yield, 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 okay? And if you can imagine what that means, it means that yield is going to um, uh, give the CPU up to somebody, and then when we come back, we uh, execute long enough to go into the loop, and then we're going to yield again, okay? And suppose we've got two threads, S and T, both running exactly the same code. So what happens? Well, thread S, A is at the top of the stack. It enters B, which is executing the while loop, which calls yield, which calls run new thread, which calls switch. And switch is going to switch to the other thread. OK? And then that switch is going to return to run new thread, which is going to return from system call to yield, which is going to return to, to the while, which is going to call yield, which is going to call uh, go into the kernel and call run new thread and call switch, which is going to switch back the other way, and then we're going to come back. Okay. So this particular example, where there's only two threads in the system and they're both running exactly the same code, what's going to happen is we're going to kind of go down the stack for S. We're going to then switch over to T and come up the stack, and then we're going to go down the stack for T, switch, come back for S. And what's interesting about this is look, what is this switch routine okay the switch routine is really simple okay and this is uh, mips code but it's gonna be very similar to what you got for risk five that you guys are all familiar with but we're going to save all of the registers of the cpu into the thread control block we're going to save the stack pointer we're going to save the return pc all of that stuff so this green thread control block is the one that we were running and now we're done with it and now we're going to load back the red one. And then when we're done, we're returning. So this, although this is written in assembly language, and I'm going to say sort of assembly language, um, pseudocode, notice that switch is a, is a routine. So we call the function switch, and it returns down here back to wherever we came from. So that, uh, well, so here's, here's the thing that I think should be interesting. So if we get in switch, Let's suppose, first of all, let, let me answer the question that's kind of on the group chat here, which is when you switch to a new thread, why are we reading the stack bottom up and not top down again? The answer is we're returning, okay? So forget this somehow getting from S to T. Let's, not, let's suspend that complexity in our mind. If we were to just have one thread in the whole system, we would call A, would call B, would call yield, which would go into the kernel, run new thread, which would call switch, and what does switch do? Switch, when it's done, returns. See the return down here? And so what does return do? Well, return pops something off the stack, right? And run new thread is a function which will pop something off the stack, which will return back to user code. And, and yield will thereby return. And then we'll go back again to yield. And then we'll go back up and down if there were only one thread in the system where 
we, the stack grows as we call forward, and as we do returns, the stack shrinks. Yeah, okay. Now, however, this, good, I'm glad you guys got that. Now the question, though, is how does this work going back and forth? Okay, why does that happen? And the answer is when we get into switch on the left, let me go back this way, we save out all of thread S's registers, and then we load in all of thread T's registers, including its stack pointer, which means really after we gotten to the bottom of the switch routine, before we hit return, we're actually over here because we're on a different stack. <laughs> so when we return after we execute switch, it takes us back up here. And then when we come down and we switch, we return back up over here. Okay, so take a second to pause, to understand that. See this back and forth. Okay, and it, it's all in here because when we, it'll never hit A again, that's correct, because there's an infinite loop. But if you, so you see there's an infinite loop here, so A is never going to come back because B just stays in the loop forever. But if you notice, what's going on here is when we change the stack pointer, to th the uh, thread T's stack, let's say, when we do this return, even though we started with thread S's stack, by the time we get down here, we're on thread T stack. So when we do a return and we have thread T's return PC, we're actually returning back into thread T, not into thread S and vice versa. Okay, and that's why we go back and forth. Okay, now I'm gonna let that marinate for you guys a little bit and we're going to explore this a little bit okay but oh good other questions the other question is after you switch does the kernel stacks thread not match the user stacks thread the answer is they still match because the the way that the user stack and the kernel stack are associated with each other is the state in the this thread the red thread for t remembers which thread uh which stack it came from. So when, when we're in thread T's kernel stack, it has associated with the thread T's user stack. Okay, so the matching up happens all the way from the kernel back up through thread T as well. Okay, so in some sense, you could say that if I were to take this S when it's suspended because I'm running in T and I were to disconnect this stack and thread control block and put it on some weight queue, so that there isn't, uh, so that S is not on the ready queue and so that the scheduler never gets it, then T will never go to S again. It'll just go to other things. Maybe it goes to U, V, W, whatever are running, but S is happily suspended in some wait queue. And the moment I put S back on the ready queue, then this behavior will start happening again and we can um, run S again. Okay, so the thread is a complete self-contained snapshot of a running state which is a thread control block and two stacks, and you can put it away and you can come back later and make it runnable, okay? So this is kind of the key idea that we've got so far, okay? So some details about that switch routine, by the way. Uh, so now what we've said essentially is, um, the PC is saved, by the way, uh, in, in all of this. It's, what, it's one of, the, um, it's one of the, the registers that are saved, okay? not actually showing you here, but it's, it's one of the PC is certainly safe. Okay. Now, um, so what we just said is the TCB plus the stacks contain a complete restartable state of the thread. Uh, and you can put it anywhere for revival. So here's a question for you. What if you screw up switch? Okay. This is like at the core of the core of the core of the core of the scheduler inside the kernel. Okay. Well, let's say you forgot to restore register 32 or something. So what's really bad about this is um, you get intermediate, intermittent failures depending on whether the user code was actually using uh, register 32 or not, okay? And uh, the system will get the wrong results without warning, okay? Um, let's hold off starting for a moment. I know people are wondering how that got started. Let's just say for now, the system has S and T running and this is just happening, okay? We haven't started anything yet. We've popped into a running state, okay? So hold your, suspend your question on that for just a second. So uh, switch is extremely important. And the question might be, is there an exhaustive test that you could uh, run of the switch code? The answer is no. 
okay? You're going you're gonna to have to look at that code and then get other people to look at that code and then look at that code again, over and over again. And, you know, it's not very long, so there's, you know, it's not going to change much and it's not going to be too complicated, but you got to be careful because if that's wrong, the whole operating system is going to be behaving weirdly and you're not going to understand why, okay? There's a cautionary tale here I like to tell sometimes, which is for speed, there was a kernel from uh, Digital Equipment Corporation's, one of their research labs called Topaz. And this was back in the days where memory was uh, very scarce. And so some very clever programmer decided to save an instruction in switch that worked fine as long as the kernel wasn't bigger than a megabyte. Now, I realize those numbers seem ridiculous to you today, but let's assume for a moment that a megabyte was a lot of, a lot of memory at one point. Okay, and as long as the kernel size was less than a megabyte or 20 bits, uh, an address, then um, this would be fine. And it was carefully documented and it saved an instruction, so it was faster. What is their motivation? Well, the core of switch is used by every switch, and so it's part of overhead, so it made sense. Let's make it smaller. The problem is, and they documented it, it was great, except time passed and people forgot. And you know, the clever person may be retired. Um, and later what happened is people started adding features to the kernel because they were getting excited about putting stuff in the kernel and it got bigger than a megabyte, okay? And once it got bigger than a megabyte, suddenly very weird behavior started, okay? And yeah, I suppose one moral of the story could be don't document. I don't, I don't wanna say that that came out of this lecture, but the moral of the story is be sure that you design for simplicity. And if you're going to, um, if you're gonna make some micro optimization, you better make sure it's really worth it, okay? All right, hashtag read the docs. Okay, the instruction would save kind of the higher part of the bits of an address um, of the kernel. Okay, so aren't we switching context here um, with, the, with the threads we've been talking about? Well, assuming we're not changing the, um, yeah, you're asking about build scripts, things weren't quite so sophisticated back then. So um, it, if we're switching just threads, okay, this is very sophisticated, this is very fast. So what I've shown you is the thread switching portion. Now, if we need to switch between processes, we're gonna have to start switching address spaces. And I wanted to give you just a little bit of an idea here. So the frequency of the context switch um, in typical operating system like Linux is somewhere in the 10 to 100 millisecond time, okay? The overhead's about three or four microseconds. So you can kind of see where this goes, all right? This is, um, you know, in the, in, in the small range here, okay? Um, now, switching between threads was much faster in a 100 nanosecond range, okay? So there's, a, you know, there's a thousand microseconds in a millisecond, okay, and a thousand nanoseconds in a microsecond. So you can kind of see where these numbers come into play. And so the key here is keeping the overheads low. And so switching between threads within a process is fast, whereas switching between uh, processes takes longer. And this extra time is really um, all, you know, this is 30 or 40 times uh, cost is really about things like saving the process state and so on. Okay. Um, now even cheaper, rather than switching threads by going into the kernel and coming back would be to run threads in user space. Now I know there was some questions about this at one point, but Let's be a little clear here for a moment. What we've been talking about and what the default thing in Linux is these days is a one-to-one uh, -one threading model where every user thread has what's called a kernel thread, okay? And I'm gonna use this terminology and you're gonna take a little time to get used to it, but a kernel thread is really um, a kernel stack that's one-to-one -one, uh, matched up with a user thread such that the user's stack gets switched out and the kernel stack is used when we're in the kernel and then when we return to the user, we use the user's stack. But the kernel stack is always there suspended. So if I have four threads, I have four kernel stacks inside the kernel matched up with user threads, okay? This is exactly what we've been talking about. And this is what Pintos does for you. Um, and this is what the basic Linux model is. But we can be faster. So for instance, we could do this where each kernel thread, where there's a kernel stack, has uh, user threads associated with it, more than one. And what we do when a user thread executes yield is it's a user level yield, where the user code library looks, knows how to do that same stack switching I just showed you, but it saves and restores 
uh, registers between threads without ever going into the kernel. So we can make the, um, we can do this user multiplexing very fast, okay? And if you were to Google green threads, for instance, this was done a lot in the early days when uh, going into the kernel was more expensive, okay? But you can do this uh, with a thread library, a threading library. A lot of early versions of Java were like this, where the threads actually all operated up here, but not in the kernel, okay? Now, the good thing about the left model, all right, is if uh, a user thread does a, a particular user thread does I.O., which puts it to sleep, this kernel thread gets put off on the sleep queue for that I.O. device, but the rest of them are still running. So they're still getting CPU time. That's good. Here in this model, the many to one model, we have multiple threads. And if any one of them goes to, into the kernel and goes to sleep on IO, all of the threads are suspended because nothing can run, okay? So while the user thread model is very fast, it, it doesn't interact with sleeping in the kernel well. And so that's why there's also a many to many model where you have a small number of kernel threads and many more user threads, okay? And that's got special library support and don't worry about it. You as a user, a programmer would just see a bunch of threads and you wouldn't, your li the library would hide this from you, okay? But today we're talking about the thing on the left for the lecture, okay? All right. Now, um, so just to show you a little bit, now our model has a CPU, potentially one CPU. Each process may have multiple threads and there might be multiple processes. And so basically the switch overhead between the same process is low because it's easy to switch threads. Between different processes is higher. We saw that factor of 30 or 40, okay? The protection between threads and a process is low. That's by design. They can share memory with each other. Between different processes, it's high. That's also by design to protect processes from one another. The overhead of sharing is low inside a process because threads can just share memory. And between processes, you got to do IPC to figure that out. And there's no parallelism, only concurrency. So in this instance, there really is only one thing actually running at a time. Now, of course, we all know about multiple cores, so we can actually introduce parallelism in here. And what happens is the top part of this model doesn't look much different, but now we have three, four, however many th uh, cores that are executing. There can be 28, in some instances, 54, whatever. And in that instance, now we start having some questions. Can we, um, you know, the switching overhead might be similar, but now if uh, we have different processes, but the same cores are running at the same time, then uh, that's medium overhead to communicate, uh, as opposed to if you're trying to communicate with a process that's completely asleep because it's not running on any core, that's higher. And yes, there's parallelism here, okay? So this is an instance where concurrency, which is really the thing we worry about, gets translated into parallelism. Okay. And I did want to say one quick thing about simultaneous multi-threading or what's called hyper-threading by Intel because um, they uh, never want to take somebody else's name for something. But we could imagine if we had a lot of uh, transistors on a chip that we could put them together and allow uh, multiple uh, operations to run simultaneously. So think about time goes down in these figures and each line here represents a cycle. And so what you see here, um, is there are three functional units in the case of the superscalar, the ones that are solid yellow are actually doing something. And so we're getting um, some parallelism here. Like for instance, this is getting three things happening at once, kind of in the middle where there's three yellows in a row. We could get a multi-core by putting several of these together. Okay, so in fact, in this middle thing, we now have two multi-cores that are the same as this one core on the left. And then hyper-threading, is a little different in that you can have two threads that get interleaved on the same core. And so now rather than these empty spots, like these uh, gray parts, we actually fill in green and yellow. And so we use much closer to 100% of the pipeline. Okay, that's called multi-threading, uh, simultaneous multi-threading or hyper-threading. Okay, and this thing on the, on the right is a much more efficient use of hardware. And a lot of Intel processes and AMD processors and so on have hyper-threading. And you get definite speed up because you're using more slots here, okay? And this original technique was called simultaneous multi-threading. You guys can take a look. But in this instance, now you'd actually have multiple threads running simultaneously uh, on the single core, okay? Whereas 
in the middle one, you could have multiple threads on, on two cores. Do GPUs have hyper-threading? So GPUs um, don't really quite have hyper-threading in the way you're thinking. GPUs are usually designed as a single, um, a single task takes over the whole GPU. Okay, hyper-threading shouldn't affect locking because if you've got a good, um, good code that will work under all circumstances of concurrency and parallelism, it shouldn't matter. Now, so what happens when the thread blocks on I.O.? Okay. Um, Hyper-threading is parallel because there's two actual threads and they are running simultaneously. Oops, I just lost my place here. Hold on a sec. My bad. Sorry about that, guys. Hold on a sec. Let me put the screen back. So now um, the question is, let's let's uh, let's uh, move forward. I want to try to catch a couple of things before we we want to get into some synchronization here. But so what happens if we block an I/O? So here's a different process that's actually copying. Uh, from one file descriptor to another. So you open one for reading and the other one for writing. We actually showed you that code a couple of lectures ago. And so now it executes a read system call. What happens? Well, we take uh, a system call into the kernel. Okay, um, you know, that's a read system call. And the read operation's initiated. And at that point, we go in to the kernel. We switch to the kernel stack. All right, and uh, we will initiate maybe the device driver on the disk to go off and read. And what happens then? Well, we run new thread and switch. So notice that uh, we can set this up so that little bouncing back and forth between S and T works perfectly well if the thing, instead of executing yield, does a read operation. Okay, works perfectly well. Okay, thread communication, so waiting for signals or joins or networking over sockets, all of that stuff has a similar behavior. So that's why this, this uh, particular paradigm of the two stacks, um, which you can put on any sort of suspend queue, plus you can put it back in the ready queue, works very well for scheduling, okay? But what happens if the thread never does I.O.? So now we want to we wanna somehow progress beyond the early days of Windows 3.1 and Macintosh. And so, you know, the Compute Pi program could grab all the resources, okay? And if it never printed to the console, never did I.O., never ran yield, we would crash the system, okay? And so there's gotta be some way to come back. And the answer here is external events. So the particular one, uh, there are a couple of them. One is interrupts, okay? Signals from hardware or software that stop the running code. And the timer like an alarm clock that goes off uh, every off so often, okay? Both of these are interrupts from the hardware that, that cause the user code to enter into the kernel, even if it wasn't going to do that. Okay, and if we make sure the external events occur frequently enough, then we get fair sharing of the CPU as well. So if you take a look here, I just wanted to say a little bit about interrupts. So a typical CPU has a bunch of devices that are all connected via interrupt lines to an interrupt controller, and that interrupt controller uh, goes through an interrupt mask, which lets us to disable interrupts, and then that goes through an encoder and tells the CPU to uh, stop what it's doing to handle an interrupt. So for instance, uh, if something comes off the network, uh, that'll generate an interrupt, which will uh, interrupt the CPU, and the CPU will go off and do network interrupt. Okay, so interrupts are invoked with interrupt lines from devices. The controller chooses which interrupt request to honor, okay, and the operating system can mask out ones that it's currently dealing with. Um, there's a priority encoder that lets us pick the highest priority ones, and uh, that whole interrupt core of the operating system. We'll get into a little more detail when we get into devices. But I'll point out a couple of things. So the CPU can disable all uh, interrupts, typically with a single bit when it's processing one interrupt. Okay, And it can change this interrupt mask to change the uh, which devices it's willing to listen to. Okay, And there's also a non-maskable interrupt, typically, which is something which uh, might get triggered when uh, say power was about to go out and there's no way for the CPU to disable that. Okay, that's kind of the, oh my gosh, hurry up and do something quickly. Um, each CPU has its own interrupt controller, that's correct. Okay, 
And uh, the question about what do we do to prevent threads from getting interrupted by uh, other CPUs is an interesting one. We'll get into we'll get into disabling of interrupts in the next uh, in the next lecture. Um, the kernel stack is in kernel memory. That's correct. And uh, it's not, and when you're at user level, you can't access that kernel stack. Otherwise, that would defeat the whole port purpose. I'll show you that next time, too. So an example of a network interrupt, we're running some code here, you know, in assembly, whatever. The interrupt happens. Typically, the pipeline gets flushed. The program counter is saved. The interrupts are saved. We go into kernel mode, which does some manipulations of masks and saves interrupts and so on. Um, and we'll re-enable interrupts. We'll talk more about that for all things except at what I'm handling typically. We go ahead and actually handle the interrupt itself by grabbing the network packet, and then we restore and uh, return back from interrupt, and at that point we can pick up. So this thing on the left that we've flushed, we've interrupted and restarted is user code, and the interrupt is able to stop the user code long enough to service the request and come back, okay? And I realize there's a lot of pieces to this. We'll talk more about them later. But an interrupt is a hardware invoked context switch. So when we had our worry about the fact that uh, perhaps user code could hold on to the processor, well, if we have a, an interrupt that occurs regularly enough, we can switch and we'll do the trick. And that trick is uh, typical uh, PCs have a timer, okay? Many timers in some instances, which are sources of interrupts. And we just program the timer to go off every 100 or 10, 10 to 100 milliseconds, and that will make sure that we're able to context switch, okay? And so that instance looks just like this. We're busy running code, and the interrupt takes us into the kernel, all right? This is not a yield arc. This is not a system call arc. What took us into the kernel was the interrupt itself, but that interrupt stack can be made to look identical, and then we just run new thread and we switch, okay? All right. And um, is there uh, protection against a malicious device constantly making interrupts? Uh, depends on the circumstances, okay? If you have a malicious device that's, and it's attached to the hardware, then under uh, bad circumstances, that can be very bad. So hopefully that doesn't happen. Okay, so how do we in, uh, initialize the TCB and stack? Well, we initialize the register fields of the thread control block. Stack pointer is made to point at the stack, all right? And uh, we, set things up with what we'll call a thread root stub, which we don't even have to initialize the stack, but we're gonna set it up to look like it's been running, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna put that on the ready queue so that if we switch to it, what it does is it returns from switch by uh, loading the re return address in a couple of registers, and as a result, it's gonna start executing just like if it had been running for a long time and executed switch. So that's this idea. This new thread root stub has been set up as an environment with a new stacks, and we've just set up the right registers so that we can fake it out to look exactly like we were running something else that called switch. So this has got a state that looks like switch, all right? And, the mo and so what does that setting up new thread do? Well, it sets up the stack pointers. It sets up a pointer to some code that needs to run and some function pointers. And then we switch to it and it runs. Okay, now this is gonna depend heavily on what calling convention we are. So I'm showing you something that looks like a MIPS or a RISC-V. If you got an x86, you have to do a little bit more with the stack to set it up. But the bottom line here is we're setting this up to, um, look like we've switched to it so that if we switch to it, it'll just start running, okay? And what does it look like? Well, the thread root does some housekeeping, it switches into user mode and it calls a function pointer, okay? And if you look here, thread root calls the thread code and it starts growing and all of a sudden we've got a thread that's running. And this is exactly the way that S and T were started in that previous slide, okay? Now, um, the question here about what happens if the user thread goes into an infinite loop, the answer is, well, because we have a timer going off, what's gonna happen is it's gonna waste its own CPU time, but others will get to run. Um, in particular, there could be somebody who comes in and kills it off, uh, and they have enough CPU to actually run, say, the shell or whatever. Okay. All right. Now, let's talk now about 
correctness, okay? And, and hopefully you guys can bear with me a little bit. Um, but now that we've got concurrent threads and we have a beginnings of an inkling about how to make sure they all run all the time, and we have an idea that if we were to disable interrupts, we might actually prevent things from switching. That's gonna be very important next lecture. We can start talking about how do we make multi-threaded or multiple process code work? And the problem is this non-determinism factor. Schedule can run threads in any order, switch at any time. And if the threads are independent, that's okay. But if they're cooperating on shared data, we've got a mess. And multiple threads inside of a single process is, are likely to be collaborating together, and then we may have a mess. Okay, and the goal here is how do we correctly design things so they work by design, regardless of how what the scheduler does to us. And I like to think of this like the scheduler is a malicious uh, Murphy's Law device whose sole job is to run your code in the order that exposes the worst concurrent bug and it's gonna do it at the worst time, okay? So that's the Murphy's Law scheduler. All schedulers are Murphy's Law schedulers. And so our only defense is to design our code correctly so that it's not subject to the Murphy's Law scheduler, okay? Um, now, when a user thread switches, there's a question in the chat here, is the kernel stack uh, preserved? Now, the one objection I would have to that question is there isn't one kernel stack. I hope you see that there's many kernel stacks, one for each thread, okay? And where they're preserved is they're on queues, and, well, empty space. They're, they're in places that are well associated with the current running thread, okay? So they're in registers associated with the operating system at that time. All right, so this is many possible executions of the Murphy's Law scheduler. So here's an example of the bank server, which I, I think I've mentioned before, but I wanna go into. So we have, an a, we have many ATMs and a central bank. And the question is, suppose we wanna implement a server process to handle requests for that. Well, we might do something like this, where the bank server grabs the next request, processes it, grabs the next request, processes it, and it does this serially one at a time. And what does process request do? It figures out what you wanna do. And if you want to deposit, uh, potentially it gets your account information, maybe using some disk IO, it adds to the balance, uh, let's say if you're depositing and then it stores the result, possibly also using disk IO and continues, okay? So more than one request being processed at once uh, would seem like a good idea here, but our naive way to do that, why would we want to do that? Well, at minimum, we'd like to get our disk IO overlapped with computation. Okay, so one option, which I'm not gonna go into right now because we're a little low on time, but we could build an event, I'll give you a very brief idea. We could build an event-driven version of this where we take that original task and we split it into a lot of pieces that are guaranteed to run to completion without ever stopping. So that would be, for instance, uh, the, the first piece would be all the way up to getting the account ID and starting the disk IO. And then another piece would be after the disk IO is done, we would add to the balance. And the next thing would be after we've done that we, and we start our disk IO when that returns, that's another piece and so on. So you'd pick these pieces between the disk IOs that we know are gonna run quickly and you'd build a dispatch loop like this where the next event, which is like the end of a disk IO, you figure out which thing you were working on and you do the next thing, okay? And that quickly ends and you put that back on the event queue and you keep doing this in a loop. All right, this event-driven way of doing things is really crazy unless you've ever done programming for windowing systems, and then this will look very familiar to you. But I will tell you that while you can program this way, it's very hard to get it right. Like you could forget a, an I.O. step, like one of these start requests or continue requests might actually uh, do an I.O. and you weren't ready for it, which is why we like to have many threads, okay? so. Threads can make this easier. So let's have one thread for every user in the system doing a request. And so what's great about this is we could have many folks all running deposits. And so, you know, their disk IOs, um, you know, might stall one of those threads, but another one would get to run. Because remember, every thread has a kernel path and can be put to sleep. So what's great is now we've got parallelism, performance, okay? But 
this is not good. So let's suppose you're depositing $10 and your parents are depositing $100 into your account at the same time. Okay, I don't know how often that happens to you, but let's suppose it happens uh, frequently. And here's you, your thread one, and here's your parents' thread two. And you, you load your balance, and your parents' thread gets to run, and it loads the balance, it adds 100 bucks and stores the balance back. And then you get to run, and you add 10 bucks, and you store the balance back. And if you look carefully at this, what you see is, how much did your account go up? $110? $10. Okay, I, I can tell you, you're not gonna be happy about that. Your parents aren't either. Uh, so we have a problem. And this problem starts showing up the moment we have threads working on the same data. Okay, concurrency. So this problem is one of the lowest level problems. So like if we have thread A and thread B, A is storing to X and B is storing to Y, normally that isn't a problem, we have a problem, okay? But, See, this isn't even a, I see somebody call, claiming that might be a Robin Hood thing. The problem is the money just went poof. Nobody got it. So that's just bad. Okay. So this, um, here is an instance which is a little crazier, right? Where um, thread A is operating on some data, including Y, and thread B is operating on Y. And suddenly we have a, a race condition. And the question might be, what are the possible values of X? And they could vary quite widely. Okay. Um, you could have x equal to one, you know, you could have x equal to three, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Many options in here, depending on how the threads are interleaved. So that's not good. Or what about this? Thread A stores uh, x equal one and B stores x equal two. If we assume that loads and stores are atomic, then x could be either one or two non-deterministically. Um, I suppose if you had some sort of weird th serial processor, you might even get three out of this where you know, A is writing 0001 and B is writing 0010 and they get interleaved and you get three. Um, that's one you don't have to worry about. Okay. But we need atomic operations, okay? And so to understand a concurrent program, you need to know the underlying indivisible operations and what they are. And so an atomic operation is an operation that always runs to completion or not at all. And it's indivisible, can't be stopped in the middle and the state can't be modified by somebody else in the middle. And it's a fundamental building block, okay? If there are no atomic operations, there's no way for threads to work together, okay? So notice that what we really wanted to happen back here in the bank case is we wanted this uh, get account, add to account, store to account, we wanted that to be atomic so that it couldn't be interleaved, okay? And so that's our atomic operation that we really want, okay? And on most machines, memory loads and stores are atomic. Um, the weird example that I gave you that gave three, that's ne that I have never seen that, okay? That's an, in an amusing thing to think about, okay? But um, things like double precision loads and stores aren't always atomic, okay? So if you have a floating point double and you're loading and storing it, you could actually get half of the, the top half of one and the bottom half of another under some circumstances, okay? So you got to know what your atomic operations are. And next time we're going to talk a lot about what the native atomic operations are over and above loads and stores, uh, which is going to be important because we're also going to show you that load and store atomic operations are um, uh, not enough, okay? Just not enough. But let's hold that discussion off. So if you remember what a lock is, a lock prevents somebody from doing something. So you lock before entering a critical section. You unlock uh, when you're done. And you wait, if the thing's already locked, uh, you wait for it to be unlocked. And so the key idea here is that all synchronization, in order to make something correct, it always involves waiting. So rather than running right away, you wait so that the atomic sections don't get interleaved, okay? So waiting is actually a good thing here as long as you don't do it excessively, okay? And so typically, as we mentioned uh, several lectures ago, locks need to be allocated. So it might be something like, uh, you know, structure lock, my lock, and then you init it, or maybe p thread mutex my lock, and you initialize it. Um, all the different systems have different ways of initializing the lock. And then you typically have acquire, which grabs the lock, and release, and they often take a pointer to the particular lock. Okay. So how do we fix the banking problem? Well, we put locks around our atomic section. So we acquire the lock and we release the lock. 
All right, so this thing in the middle is what we call a critical section. The critical section is the atomic operation that we've chosen that we only want one thread in at a time. And the gatekeepers are gonna be the acquire and release, okay? And so here's an example just to show you. So if we have a bunch of threads, here's some animation, right? Thread A, B, and C, they all reach the acquire. If we let them into that critical section more than one at a time, we get chaos. But the lock will actually pick one to let through. And so now A gets to run. And then when it exits and calls release, then the next one gets to run. So now B gets to go. And then C gets to go, et cetera. Okay. So you, in order to make this all work properly in a banking operation, we must use the same lock with all the methods, withdraw, et cetera, that uh, are operating on the same data. So part of this is now we have to analyze our problems properly. Okay. So if you remember some definitions, synchronization are using atomic operations to give us cooperation between threads. So for now, loads and stores are the only ones. Mutual exclusion is this idea of producing or preventing more than one thread from an area. We're going to mutually exclude things so that only one thread gets to run. And the thing we're, we're excluding from is this critical section. And so this, at the simplest level, this idea of uh, figuring out how to fix a synchronization issue is doing an analysis of where do I need my critical sections, what's my shared data, and where are my locks? Okay, now we're going to get a lot more sophisticated in a bit. Okay. Um, but another concurrent program example might be two threads A and B are competing with each other. A gets to run, B gets to run. Okay, so um, what do we see here? Well, assume that memory loads and stores are atomic, but incrementing and decrementing is not. So by the way, I equal I plus one and I plus plus, they're the same as far as this con concern because they compile to the same thing. And what happens here? Who wins? Well, it could be either, okay? And this is, um, is it guaranteed that somebody wins? Well, maybe not, because they're going to keep overriding each other, okay? Because I is a shared variable. And um, if both uh, threads have their own CPU running at the same speed, do we know uh, that maybe it goes on forever and nobody finishes because they never managed to get I less than 10 or greater than minus 1, okay? So um, the inner loop looks like this. You know, we load, we load, we add, we add, we store, we store. And notice what just happened. We overwrote, so thread B overwrote the results of thread A. And so the hand simulation here is like, oh, and we're off. A gets off to an early start. B says, oh, got to go fast, tries really hard. A goes, gets ahead and writes a one. B gets a, then goes and writes a minus one. A says, what? OK, this is not, in, in answer to the question on the chat, we're not talking about two processes, we're talking about two threads inside the same process, okay? And so they're actually uh, sharing I, okay? And for the person worrying about coherency and sequential consistency, let's, uh, let's assume we're sequentially consistent and not worry about that question so, for now. So I, uh, each thread has its own stack, yes, but there's a global variable I. So this issue we're seeing here is because the global variable I is shared, OK, now they may not run simultaneously under all circumstances, but if there's a if we have multiple cores or we have multi threading of some sort, like simultaneous multi threading, they might run at the same time or the scheduler might switch at exactly the wrong time. And so the answer is you got to think about this as if the scheduler is going to pick the worst possible interleaving because it will happen once in a thousand times or once in a million times. And it'll happen at three in the morning when an airplane will crash because of the bug, right? All right, the Murphy's Law of Schedulers is the best thing to think about, okay? So this particular example is the worst example that you can come up with. This is an uncontrolled race condition, whereas two threads are attempting to access the same data simultaneously with one of them performing a light, uh, right, okay? And here simultaneous is defined, even though you know one CPU, maybe there's only one CPU, we're thinking about this from a concurrency standpoint, such that Murphy's scheduler could, under weird circumstances, flop back and forth. So does this fix it? Well, we just put locks 
acquire and release around the i and the i minus i plus one and i equals i minus one. Did this fix it? Okay. Well, it's better because we don't we always atomic atomically increment or decrement. It's you know, so it's the uh, atomic operations are good, and, and technically there's no race here now because a race is a situation where there's a read where two threads are accessing the same data and one of them's a write. Okay, if you ever had that circumstance, you've got a race, and that's really bad. So this is no longer a race because the acquire and release will actually prevent uh, two threads from being in the middle where they're updating i at the same time. So that's not a race, but it's probably not still it's probably still broken because you've got this uncontrolled incrementing and decrementing going on and it's not likely to be what you wanted okay uh, when might something like this make sense well if you each thread is supposed to get one unique value hold on uh, for me just a sec here we're getting close to being done um, each thread needs one unique value uh, of i then you might do something like this but you're not going to do this while loop where one's going up and one's going down okay and in fact, you've already seen this example with a red block tree, red black tree, excuse me. What you might do here is there's a single lock at the root, okay? And thread A, when it doesn't insert, what it does is it grabs the, the lock at the root, it does insert and it releases it. B might insert uh, by grabbing the lock, doing an insert releasing, and then doing a get by grabbing the lock, uh, inserting and releasing. Here, both threads are modifying and reading the tree, but the reason we have locking in here is to make sure the, the tree itself is always correct. Okay, so here the lock's associated with the root of the tree. There's no races at the operational level, okay, um, inside the tree. So threads are exchanging information through a consistent data structure. This is probably okay, okay. Can you make it faster? You're going to be tempted when we get you doing on the working on the file system. A, one temptation might be well, the problem is when thread A acquires the lock, it locks the whole tree, and we don't really need to do that. There are ways that certain tree operations where you can go down and have a lock per node and, and deal with uh, locking only subtrees that you're actually going to change, but you got to be really careful about that. So concurrency is very hard. And unfortunately, I was hoping to get to, to um, semaphores today. But uh, even for practicing engineers, it's hard. Okay, Th this analysis of what you need to lock and so on is, is something that people don't always get right. And I, I just wanted to give you a couple of examples. So the Therac th uh, 25 radiation machine, there's a, there's a um, reading that's up on the resources page for us, is a great example of what happens when uh, there's a concurrency bug. So what happened was this was a radiation machine that uh, could either uh, do um, electron, um, could either have electrons or pho photons, a very high uh, X-ray style photons. And the way it did that was it either had a target or not. If it had a target, it would set a bunch of electrons at that target and what would come out is X-rays. Otherwise it could use the, the uh, electrons directly. And uh, the problem was there was a bug such that when the operator was typing too fast, it actually screwed up the positioning that would pick the target and the dosage, and they they fried a bunch of people, literally. They they died from radiation poisoning. It was awful, okay? Um, there's a there's a, a interesting priority inversion that um, is up on today's reading as well. We'll talk about that when we get into priority inversions. Um, there's also a, a talk about uh, this Toyota uncontrolled acceleration problem, which was also a synchronization problem, okay? So what I want you guys to do is take your synchronization very seriously. All right. Now, um, I think, uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to get to the uh, semaphore discussion today. Um, if you take a look, um, there's some pretty good slides on, on semaphores, and maybe I'll see if I can um, put up... Uh, a little more um, audio on that for later, but I want to let you guys go. Uh, today we we uh, really talked about concurrency. Okay, um, we we showed how to multiplex CPUs by unloading the current thread, loading the next thread, and uh, getting context switching either voluntarily or through interrupts. Uh, we talked about how the 
thread control block for this plus the stacks give the complete state of the thread and allow you to put it aside when it needs to go to sleep. And then we started this discussion about atomic operations, synchronization, mutual exclusion, and critical sections. Those four things together are part of the discussion and the design that's involved in understanding how to make a correct by design multi-threaded application. And we, we did some a lot of discussion of uh, locks, which is a synchronization mechanism for enforcing mutual exclusion on critical sections. I gave you some good examples. Semaphores are a different type of uh, more powerful than lock synchronization. Um, take a look on the slides. I know they talked about this in section last week as well. So you guys have a great uh, weekend. Um, we will see you on Monday and um, have a good night. And the, get outside a little bit if you're in the local area here because we can actually breathe for a change. That's good. All right. Ciao.